the Lancashire Witches, Chapter 7, The Ruined Conventual Church, beneath a wild cherry tree, planted by chance in the Abbey Garden, and of such remarkable size that it almost rivaled the elms and lime trees surrounding it, and when in bloom, resembled an enormous garland to two young maidens, both of rare beauty, though in totally different styles, the one being fair-haired and blue-eyed, with a snowy skin tinged with delicate blue, like that of roses seen through milk, borrow a smile from old Anacreon, while the other far eclipsed her in the brilliance of her complexion, the dark splendour of her eyes, and the luxuriance of her jetty tresses, which unbound and knotted with ribbon, flowed down almost to the ground. In age there was little disparity between them, though perhaps the dark-haired girl might be a year nearer twenty than the other, and somewhat more of seriousness, though not much sat on her lovely countenance than on the other's laughing features. Different were they two in degree, and here social position was infinitely in favour of the fairer girl, but no one would have judged it so if not previously acquainted with their history. Indeed, it was rather the one having the least title to be proud, if anyone has such a title, who now seemed to look to her companion with mingled admiration and regard, the latter being enthralled at the moment by the rich notes of a thrush poured from a neighbouring lime tree. Pleasant was the garden where the two girls stood, shaded by grey trees, laid out in exquisite hearteries, with knots and vigours, quaint flower beds, shorn trees and hedges, covered alleys and arbours, terraces and mounds, in the taste of the time, and above all, an admirably kept bowling green. In front of the maiden stood a square tower, part of the fences of the religious establishment erected by Abbot Lindeley in the reign of Edward III, but disused and decaying. It was sustained by high and richly groined arches crossing the swift mill race and face the river. A path led through the ruined chapter house to the spacious cloister quadrangle once used as a cemetery for the monk, but now converted into a kitchen garden, its broad area being platted out and root trees trained against the hoary walls. Little of the old refectory was left except the dilapidated stairs once conducting to the gallery, where the brethren were wont to take their meals. The inner wall still served to enclose the garden on that side of the dormitory, formerly constituting the eastern angle of the cloisters. The shell was still left, and it was used partly as a grange, partly as a shed cattle, the farmyard and tenements lying on the side. Thus it will be seen that the garden and grounds filling up the ruins of Wally Abbey afforded abundant points of picturesque attraction, all of which, with the exception of the ruined conventual church, had been visited by the two girls. They attracted the labyrinths of passengers, scaled broken staircases, crept into the roofless and neglected chambers, peered timorously into the black and yawning vaults, and now having finished their investigation, had paused for a while, previous to extending their ramble to the church beneath a wild cherry tree to listen to the warbling of the birds. You should hear the nightingales at Middleton, Allison, observed Dorothy Asherton, breaking silence. They sing even more exquisitely than your rush. You must come and see me. I would like to show you the old house and garden, though they are very different from these, and we have no ancient monastic ruin to ornament them. Still, they are very beautiful. And as I find you are fond of flowers, I will show you some. I have reared myself, for I am something of a gardener. Alison, promise you will come. I wish I dared promise it, replied Alison. And why not then, cried Dorothy. What should prevent you? Do you know, Alison, what I should like better than all? You are so amiable, and so good, and so very pretty. Nay, don't blush. There is no one by to hear me. You are so charming altogether that I should like you to come and live with you. Shall be my handmaiden, if you will. I should desire nothing better, sweet young lady, replied Alison. But for what, cried Dorothy, you have only your own consent to obtain. Alas, I have replied Alison. How can that be? cried Dorothy, with a disappointed look. It is not likely your mother will stand in the way of your advancement, and you have not, I suppose, any other tie. Nay, forgive me if I appear too inquisitive. My curiosity only proceeds from the interest I take in you. I know it, I feel it, dear kind young lady, replied Alison, with a colour again mounting her cheeks. I have no tie in the world except my family, but I am persuaded my mother will never allow me to twitter, however great the advantage might be to me. Well, though, sorry, I am scarcely surprised at his said Dorothy, but she must love you too dearly to part with you. I wish I could think so, sighed Alison. And proud of me in some sort, or with little reason she may be, but love me more assertively she does not. Nay, more, I am persuaded she would be glad to be freed from my presence, which is an evident restraint and annoyance to her, were it not with some motive stronger than natural affection that binds her to me. Now, in good sooth, you amaze me, Alison, cried Dorothy. What possible motive can it be, if not of affection, of interest, I mean, cried Alison. I speak to you without reserve, dear young lady, for the sympathy you have shown me deserves and demands confidence on my part, and there are none with whom I can freely converse, so that every emotion has been lost in my own bosom. My mother fancies I shall one day be of use to her, and therefore keeps me with her. Hints to this effect she has thrown out when indulging in the uncontrollable fits of passion to which she is liable, and yet I have no just reason to complain, for though she has shown me little eternal tenderness and repelled all exhibition or affection on my part, she has treated me very differently from her other children, and with much greater consideration. I can make slight force of education, but the best the village could afford has been given me, and I have derived 
most religious culture from good doctor or Murad, the kind lady of the vicarage was as you have done that I should live with them but my mother forbade it enjoining me on the peril of incurring her displeasure not to leave her and reminding me of all the benefits I have received from her and of the necessity of making an adequate return and ungrateful indeed I should be if I did not comply for though her manner is harsh and cold to me she has never ill used me as she has done her favourite child my little sister Janet has always allowed me a separate chamber where I can retire when I please to read or meditate or pray for alas dear young lady I dare not pray for my mother be not shocked at what I tell you I cannot hide in my warm mother in the consolation of religion never addresses herself to heaven in prayer never opens the book of life and truth never enters church in her own mistaken way she has brought up poor little Janet who has been taught to make a scoff at religious truths and ordinances and has never been suffered to keep all the Sabbath day happy and thankful am I that no such evil lessons have been taught me but rather that I have profited by the sad example in my own secret chamber I prayed daily and nightly for both prayed that their hearts might turn often have I besought my mother to let me take Janet to church but she never would consent and in that poor misguided child dear young lady there is a strange mixture of good ill afflicted with personal deformity and delicate in health the mind perhaps sympathizingly with the body she is wayward and uncertain in temper but sensitive and keenly alive kindness and with her shrewdness beyond her years at the risk of offending my mother for I felt confident I was acting rightly I have endeavoured to instill religious principles into her heart and to inspire her with a love of truth sometimes she has listened to me and I have observed strange troubles in her nature as if the good were obtaining mastery of the evil principle and I have striven the more to convince her and win her over but never with entire success for my efforts have been overcome by pernicious counsels and skeptical sneers oh dear lady what would I not do to be the instrument of her salvation you pain me much by this relation Alison said Dorothy Ashton who had listened with profound attention and I now wish more ardently than ever to take you from such family I cannot believe them dear young lady replied Alison for I feel I may be of infinite service especially to Janet by staying with them where there is a soul to be saved especially the soul of one dear as a sister no sacrifice can be too great to make no price too heavy to pay by the blessing of heaven I hope to save her and that is the great tie that binds me to her own only soul in name I will not oppose your virtuous intentions dear Alison replied Dorothy but I now must mention a circumstance in connection with your mother of which you are perhaps in ignorance but which it is right you should know and therefore no false delicacy on my part shall restrain me from mentioning it your grandmother old MD is in a very ill repute in Pendle and is stigmatised by the common world and even by others as a wish your mother too shares in the opprobrium attaching to her I dreaded this replied Alison turning deadly pale and trembling violently I feared you had a terrible report but all believe it not my poor mother is hearing enough but she is not so bad as that all believe it not I will not leave it Dora, since she is blessed with such a daughter as you but what I fear is that you you so kind so good so beautiful may come under the same ban I must run this risk also in the good work I have appointed myself replied Alison if I am ill bought or by men I shall have the approval of my conscience to hold me whatever be tied and whatever be said do not you think ill of me dear young lady fear it not turned Dorothy earnestly while thus conversing they gradually strayed away from the cherry tree and taking a winding path leading to that direction entered the conventual church about the middle of the south aisle the door was closed but it easily opened when tried by Dorothy and they found themselves in a small but beautiful chapel what struck them chiefly in it was a magnificent monument of white marble enriched with numerous small shields painted and gilt sporting two recumbent figures representing Henry de Lacy one of the founders of the abbey and his consort the knight was cased in plate armour covered with a circle emblazoned with his arms and his feet resting upon a hound this superb monument was wholly uninjured the painting and gilding being still fresh and bright beyond it a flag had been removed discovering a flight of sea stone steps leading to a vault or other subterranean chamber after looking round this chapel Dorothy remarked there is something else that has just occurred to me when a child a strange dark tale was told to me to the effect that the last ill-fated abbot of Wally laid his dying curse upon your grandmother that an infant predicting that she should be a witch and the mother of witches I have heard the dread tradition too rejoined Alison but I cannot will not believe it no benign power will never sanction so terrible implications far be it from me to affirm the contrary I adore it but it is undoubted that some families have been and are under the influence of an inevitable vitality in one respect connected also with the same unfortunate relay and might instance our own family Abbot Paslow is said to be unlucky to us even in his grave if such a curse as I have described hangs over the head of your family all your efforts to remove it will be ineffectual I trust not said Alison oh dear young lady you have now penetrated the secret of my heart the mystery of my life is laid upon to you disguise it as I may I cannot but believe my mother to be under some baneful influence her unholy life her strange actions all 
impress me with the idea, and there is the same tendency in Janet. You have a brother, have you not inquired of it? I have returned Allison, slightly colouring, but I see little of him, for he lives near my grandmother in Pendle Forest, and always avoids me in his rare visits here. You will think it strange when I tell you I have never beheld my grandmother, MD. I'm glad to hear it, exclaimed Dorothy. I have never even been to Pendle, pursued Allison, though Janet and my brother go there frequently. At one time, I much wished to see my aged relative and press my mother to take me with her, but she refused, and now I have no desire to go. Strange, exclaimed Dorothy. Everything you tell me strengthens the idea. I can see the moment I saw you, and which my brother also entertained, that you are not the daughter of Elizabeth Device. Did your brother think this? cried Allison eagerly, but she immediately cast down her eyes. He did, replied Dorothy, not noticing her confusion. It is impossible, he said, that that lovely girl can be sprung from, but I will not wound you by adding the rest. I cannot disown my kindred, said Allison. Still, I must confess that some notions of the sort across me, arising probably from my mother's extraordinary treatment and from many other circumstances which, though trifling in themselves, were not without weight in leading me to the conclusion. Hitherto, I have treated it only as a passing fancy, but if you and Master Richard Ashton and her voice slightly faltered as she pronounced the name, think so, it may warrant me in more serious considering the matter. Do consider it more seriously, dear Alison, cried Dorothy. I have made up my mind, and Richard has made up his mind too, that you are not Mother Demdee's granddaughter, nor Elizabeth Device's daughter, nor Janet's sister, nor any relation of theirs. We are sure of it, and we will have you of our mind. The fair and animated speaker could not help noticing the blushes that mantled Alison G as she spoke, but she attributed them to other than the true cause, nor did she mend the matter as she proceeded. I am sure you are well born, Alison, she said, and so it will be found in the end. And Richard thinks so too, for he said so to me, and Richard is my oracle, Alison. To spite of herself, Alison's eyes sparkled with pleasure, but she speedily checked the emotion. I must not indulge a dream, she said with a sigh. Why not, cried Dorothy. I will have strict inquiries made as to your history. I cannot consent to it, replied Alison. I cannot leave one who, if she be not my parent, has stood to me in that relation. Neither can I have her brought into trouble on my accident. What will she think of me if she learns I have indulged such a notion? She will say, and with truth, that I am the most ungrateful of human beings, as well as the most unnatural children. No, dear young lady, it must not be these fantasies of brilliant, but fallacious, and like bubbles burst as soon as formed. I admire your sentiments, or I do not admit the justice of your reasoning, rejoined Dorothy. It is not on your own account merely, though that is much, that the secret of your birth, if there be one, ought to be cleared up. But for the sake of those with whom you are connected, there may be a mother like mine weeping for you as lost a brother like Richard mourning you as dead. Think of the sad hearts your restoration will make joyful as to Elizabeth Device, no consideration should be shown her. If she has stolen you from your parents, as I suspect, she deserves no pity. All this is merely place surmise, dear young lady, replied Alison. At this junction, they were startled by seeing an old woman come from behind the monument and plant herself for them. Both uttered a cry and would have fled, but a gesture from the throne detained them. Very old was she, and of strange and sinister aspect, almost blind, bent double, with frosted brows and chin, and shaking with palsy. Stay where you are, cried the hag in an imperious tone. I want to speak to you. Come nearer to me. My pretty wean, nearer, nearer. And as they complied, drawn towards her by an impulse they could not resist, the old woman caught hold of Alison's arm and said with a chuckle, So you are the wench they call Alison Device? I replied Alison, trembling like a door in the talons of a hawk. Do you know who I am? cried the hag, grasping her yet more tightly. Do you know who I am? I say. If not, I will tell you. I am Mother Chattox of Pendle Forest, the rival of Mother Demdike, and the enemy of all the earth. A curse through. Now do you know me, wench? Men call me witch. Whether I am so or not, I have some power, as they and you shall find. Mother Demdi has often defied me, often injured me, but I will have my revenge upon her. Ah, let me go, cried Alison, greatly terrified. I will run and bring assistance, cried Dorothy, and she flew to the door, but he resisted her attempts to open it. Come back, screamed the hag. You strive in vain. The door is fast shut, fast shut. Come back, I say. Who are you? She added, as the maid drew near, ready to sing with terror. Your voice is an Asherton voice. I know you now. You are Dorothy Asherton, a skin blue eyed Dorothy. Listen to me, Dorothy. I owe your family a grudge, and if you provoke me, I will pay it off in part on you. Sir, not as you value your life. The poor girl did not dare to move, and Alison remained as if fascinated by the terrible old woman. I will tell you what has happened, Dorothy, pursued with Chattox. I came hither to Warley on business of my own, meddling with no one, harming no one, tread upon the adder, and it will bite, and when molested, I bite like the adder. Your cousin, Nick Ashton, came in my way, called me wit, and menaced me. I cursed him. Ha ha. And then your brother Richard, what of him in heaven's name, almost shrieked Alison. How's this? exclaimed Mother Chattox, placing her hand on the beating heart girl. What of Richard Ashton? repeated Alison. You love him. I feel you do 
when tried all on vs exaltation release me wicked woman cried alice and wicked am i ha ha rejoined more chat off chuckling maliciously because for so i read thy heart and betray secrets wicked i tell thee when again richard ashton is lord and master here every pulse in thy bosom beats for him for him alone but beware of his love beware of it i say shall bring thee ruin and despair for pity's sake release me lord alice and not yet replied an inexorable old woman not yet my tale is not hard told my curse fell on richard's head as it did on nicholas's and then the hellhounds fought to catch me but there were fault i treat them nicely <laughs> however they took my nance my pretty nance they seized her bound her bore her to the calder and there swam her curses light on them all all but chief on him who did it who was he inquired allison trembling left jem device replied old woman it was he who bound her he who plunged her in the river he who swam her but i will pinch and plague him for it i will strew his couch with nettles and all wholesome food shall be poison to him his blood shall be as water and his flesh shrink from his bones he shall waste away slowly 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 till he drops like a skeleton into the grave ready for him all connected with him shall feel my fury i would kill thee now if thou wert alt of his alt of his what mean you old woman demanded alison why this rejoined mother chatos and let the knowledge work in thee to the confusion of best device thou art not her daughter it is as though cried dorothy ashton roused by the intelligence from her terror i tell thee not this secret to pleasure thee continued mother chatos to confound elizabeth device i have no other motive she have provoked my vengeance and i shall make sure she feels it thou art not her child i say the secret of thy birth is known to me but the time is not yet come for its disclosure it shall out one day to the confusion of those who offend me but when thou goest home tell thy reputed mother what i have said and mark how she takes the information ha who comes here the hag's last exclamation was occasioned by the sudden appearance of mistress nutter who opened the door of the chapel and staring in astonishment at the group came quickly forward what makes you here mother chatot cried i came here to avoid pursuit replied the old hag with a cowed manner and in accents sounding strangely submissive after a late infuriated one what have you been saying to these girls demanded mistress nutter authoritatively as them the hag replied she declares that allison is not the daughter of elizabeth device cried dorothy ashton indeed exclaimed mistress nutter quickly and as if a spring of extraordinary interest had been suddenly told what reason hast thou for this assertion no good reason replied the old woman evasively yet with evident apprehension of a questioner good reason or bad i will have it cried mistress nutter what you to take an interest in the wench like the rest turned mother chat off is she so very winning that is no answer to my question said the lady whose child is she ask best device or mother dem d replied mother chat off say no more about the matter than me i will have thee speak and to the purpose cried the lady angrily many and one has lost a child who would gladly have it back again said the old hag mysteriously who have lost one asked mistress nutter nay pass me to tell replied the old woman with affected ignorance question those who saw her i have set you on the track if you fail in pursuing it come to me you know where to find me you shall not go thus said mistress nutter i will have a direct answer now and as she spoke she waved her hand twice or thrice over the old woman in doing this her figure seemed to dilate and her countenance underwent a marked and fearful change all her beauty vanished her eyes blazed and terror sat on her wrinkled brow the hag on the contrary crouched lower down and seemed to dwindle less than her ordinary size rivering as from heavy blows and with a mixture of malice and fear in her countenance she cried were i to speak you would not thank me let me go answer for freighted mistress nutter disregarding the caution and speaking in a sharp piercing voice strangely contrasting with her ordinary utterance answer i say or i will beat thee to dust and she continued her gestures while the sufferings of the old hag evidently increased and she crouched nearer and nearer to the ground mourning out the words do not force me to speak you will repent it you will repent it do not torment her thus madam cried allison who with dorothy looked at the strange scene with mingled apprehension and wonderment much as i desire to know the secret of my birth i would not obtain it thus and she uttered these words the old woman contrived to shuffle off and disappear behind the tomb why did you interpose allison cried mistress nutter somewhat angrily and dropping her hands you broke the power i had over her i would have compelled her to speak i thank you gracious lady for your consideration replied allison gratefully but the sight was too painful what has become of her where is she gone cried dorothy peeping behind the tomb she has crept into this vault i suppose do not trouble yourself about her ma dorothy said mistress nutter resuming her wanted voice and wanted looks let us return to the house thus much is sustained allison that you are no child of your soul's parent wait a little and the rest shall be found out for you and meantime he is sure that i take strong interest in you. that we all do added dorothy thank you thank you exclaimed alice almost overpowered with this they went forth and traversing the shattered aisle quitted the conventual church and took their way along the alley leading to the garden say not a word at present to elizabeth advice of the information you have obtained alice observed mistress nutter i have reasons for this counsel which i will after
afterwards explain to you, and do you keep silence on the subject, though? May I not tell Richard, said the young lady, not Richard, not anyone, returned Mr. Stone, or you may seriously affect Alison's prospect. You have cautioned me in times, cried Dorothy, for here comes my brother with our cousin Nicholas, and as she saw, a turn in the alley showed Richard and Nicholas Ashton advancing towards them. A strange revolution had been produced in Alison's feelings by the events of the last half hour. The opinions expressed by Dorothy Ashton as to her birth being singularly confirmed by much chatos, but could reliance be placed on the old woman's assertions? Might they not have been made with a mischievous intent, and was it not possible, nay, probable, that in her place of concealment behind the tomb, the vindictive hag had overheard the previous conversation with Dorothy, and based her own declaration upon it? All these suggestions occurred to Alison, but the previous idea, having once gained admission to her breast, soon established itself firmly there, in spite of doubts and misgivings, and began to mix itself up with new thoughts and wishes with which other persons were connected, for she could not help fancying she might be well born, and if so, the vast distance here to fall existing between her and Richard Ashton might greatly diminish, if not altogether removed. So rapid is the progress of thought that only a few minutes were required for this long train of reflection to pass through her mind, and it was merely put blight by the approach of the main object of her thoughts. On joining the party, Richard Ashton saw plainly that something had happened, but as both his sister and Alison laboured under evident embarrassment, he abstained from making inquiries as to its cause for the present, hoping a better opportunity of doing so would occur, and the conversation was kept up by Nicholas Ashton, who described in his wanted lively manner the encounter with Mother Chattox and Nance Redburn, the swimming of the latter, and the degree and punishment of pots. During the recital, Mrs. Nutter often glanced uneasily at two girls, but neither of them offered any interruption until Nicholas had finished when Dorothy, taking her brother's hand, said with a look of affectionate admiration, You acted like yourself, dear Richard. Alison did not venture to give utterance to the same sentiment, but her look plainly expressed it. I only wish you had punished that cruel James device, as well as say for Nance, added Dorothy. Hush, exclaimed Richard, glancing at Alison. You need not be afraid of hurting her feelings, cried the young lady. She does not mind him now. What do you mean, Dorothy? cried Richard in surprise. Oh, nothing, nothing, replied hastily. Perhaps you will explain, said Richard to Alison. Indeed I cannot, she answered in confusion. You would have laughed to see Potts creep out of the river, said Nicholas, turning to Dorothy. He looked just like a drowned rat. Ha ha. You have made a bitter enemy of him, Nicholas, observed Mistress Nutter. So look well to yourself. I hear him not rejoin the squire. He knows me now too well to meddle with me again, and I shall take good care how I put myself in his power. One thing I may mention to show the important malice of the knave, just as he was setting off, he said, This is not the only discovery of witchcraft I have made today. I have another case near home. What could he mean? I know not, replied Mistress Nutter, a shade of disquietude passing over her countenance, but he is quite capable of bringing the charge against you or any of us. He is so, said Nicholas. After what has occurred, I wonder whether he will go over to Rugby tomorrow. Very likely not, replied Mistress Nutter, and in that case, Master Roger Norwell must provide some other person competent to examine the boundary line of properties on his yard. Then you are confident of the adjudication being in your favour, said Nicholas. Quite so, replied Mistress Nutter with a self satisfied smile. The result, I hope, may justify your expectations, said Nicholas. But it is right to tell you that Sir Ralph, in consenting to postpone his decision, has only done so out of consideration to you. If the division of the properties be as represented by him, Master Norwell will unquestionably obtain an award in his favour. Under such circumstances, he may, said Mistress Nutter. But you will find the contrary turn out to be the fact. I will show you a plan I have had lately prepared, and you can then judge for yourself. While thus conversing, the party passed through a door in the high stone wall, dividing the garden from the court, proceeding towards the principal entrance of the mansion built out of the ruins of the abbey, which has served as a very convenient quarry for the construction of this edifice, as well as for Fort Field, a house with a large and irregular plan, chiefly with a view of embodying part of the old abbot's lodgings, and consisting of a wide front with two wings, one of which looked into the court and the other comprehensive ending the long gallery to guard the old north east gate of the abbey, with its lofty archway and embattled walls, served as an entrance to the great courtyard, and at its wicked ordinary stood Ned Huddlestone, the porter, though he was absent on the present occasion, being occupied with the May Day festivities. Immediately opposite the gateway sprang a flight of stone steps with a double landing place and a broad balustrade of the same material on the lowest pillar of which was placed a large escutcheon sculptured with the arms of the family argent and mullet sable with a rebus on the name and ash on a ton. The great door to which these steps conducted stood wide open, and before it on the upper landing place were collected Lady Ashton, Mistress Raddle, Mistress Nicholas, Ashton, and some other dames, laughing and conversing together. Some long-eared spaniel favourites of the lady of the house were chasing each other up and down the steps, disturbing the slumbers of a couple of fine bloodhounds in the courtyard, pursuing the proud he fowl that strutted about to display their gorgeous plumage to the spectators. On seeing the party approach, Lady Ashton came down to me.
me that you have been long absent, she said to Dorothy, but I suppose you have been exploring the ruins. Yes, we have not left the hall or corner unvisited, was the reply. That is right, said Lady Ashton. I knew you would make a good guy, Dorothy. Of course, you have often seen the old conventual church for Alison. I am ashamed to say I am not your ladyship, she replied. Indeed, exclaimed Lady Ashton. And yet you have lived all your life in the village. Quite true, your ladyship, answered Alison. But these ruins have been prohibited to me. Not by us, said Lady Ashton. They are open to everyone. I was forbidden to visit them by my mother, said Alison. And for the first time, the word mother seemed strange to her. Lady Ashton looked surprised, but made no remark, and mounting the steps, led away to a spacious, though not very lofty chamber, with huge uncovered rafters and a floor of polished floor over a great fireplace at one side, furnished with immense andirons, hung a noble pair of antlers, and similar trophies of chase were affixed to other parts of the wall. She did not tarry long within the entrance hall, for much it was who conducted her guest through an arched doorway on the right into the long gallery. 150 feet in length and proportionately wide and lofty, this vast chamber had undergone little changes since its original construction by the old owners of the Abbey. Quitting the rest of the company and proceeding to the southern window, Dorothy invited Alison and her brother to place themselves beside her on the cushioned seats of the embrasure. Little conversation, however, ensured Alison's heart began to fill from utterance, and recent occurrences engrossing Dorothy's thoughts to the exclusion of everything else. Having made one or two unsuccessful efforts to engage them in talk, Richard likewise lapsed into silence and gazed out on the lovely scenery for him. The evening has been described as beautiful, and the sweet powder as it hurried by was tinged with rays of the declining sun, whilst the woody heights of Wally Nab were seen in the same rosy light. But the view failed to interest Richard in his present mood, and after a brief survey, he saw a look at Alison and was surprised to find her in tears. What saddening thoughts crossed you, fair girl? He inquired with deep interest. I can hardly account for my sudden despondency, she replied, but I have heard that great happiness is a precursor of dejection, and the saying I suppose must be true, for I have been happier today than I ever was before in my life. But the feeling of sadness is now past, she added smiling. I am glad of it, said Richard. May I not know what has occurred to you? Not at present, in towards Dorothy, but I am sure you will be pleased when you are made way into the circumstances. I will tell you now if I mind. May I guess, said Richard. I don't know, rejoined Dorothy, who was dying to tell him. May he? Oh, no, no, cried Alison. You are very perverse, said Richard, with a look of disappointment. There can be no harm in guessing, and you can please yourself as to giving an answer. I fancy then that Alison has made some discovery. Dorothy nodded. Relative to her parentage, pursued Richard. Another nod. She has found out she is not Elizabeth Device's daughter, said Richard. Some witch must have told you this, exclaimed Dorothy. Have I indeed guessed rightly? cried Richard with an eagerness that startled his sister. Do not keep me in suspense. Speak plainly. How am I to answer him, Alison? said Dorothy. Nay, do not appeal to me, dear young lady. She answered, blushing. I have gone too far to retreat, rejoined Dorothy, and therefore, despite Mistress Nutter's interdiction, the truth shall out. You have guessed assuredly. Richard, a discovery has been made, a very great discovery. Alison is not a daughter of Elizabeth Device. The intelligence delights me, though it scarcely surprises me, cried Richard, gazing with heartfelt pleasure at blushing girl. What I was sure of that from the first, nothing so good and so charming as Alison could spring from so foul a source. How and by what means you have derived this information, as well as whose daughter you are, I shall wait patiently to learn. Enough of me, you are not the sister of James Device. Enough, you are not the grandchild of Mother Demdee. You know all I know in knowing thus much, replied Alison. Alison timidly, and secrecy has been enjoined by Mrs. Nutter in order that the rest may be bound out. But, oh, should the hopes I have perhaps too hastily indulged prove fallacious? They cannot be fallacious, Alison interrupted Richard eagerly. On that score, rest easy. Your connection with that wretched family is forever broken, but I can see the necessity of caution and shall observe it. And so Mrs. Nutter takes an interest in you. The strongest, replied Dorothy, will see she comes this way, but we must now go back for a short space. While Mrs. Nutter and Nicholas were seated at a table examining a pan of the Say. The latter was greatly astonished to see the door open and give admittance to Master Potts, who he fancied snugly lying between the blankets of the dragon. The attorney was clad in a riding dress which he had exchanged for his wet habiliments, and was accompanied by Sir Ralph Ashton and Master Roger Norwell. On seeing Nicholas, he instantly stepped up to him. Ah, squire, he cried, you did not expect to see me again so soon, eh? A pottle of hot sack put my blood into circulation, and having only a change of raiment in my valas, I am all right again. Not so easy got rid of you see. So it appears, replied Nicholas, laughing. We have a travelling account to settle together, sir, said the attorney, putting on a serious look. Whenever you please, sir, replied Nicholas, good humouredly tapping the hilt of his sword. Not in that way, cried Hart, starting quickly by. I never fight with those weapons, never. Our dispute must be settled in a court of law, sir. In a court of law. You understand, Master Nicholas, there is a shrewd maxim, Master Hart, that he who is his own lawyer as a fool for his client, observed Nicholas dryly. Would it not be better to stick to the defence of others rather than practice in your own behalf. You have expressed my opinion, Master Nicholas, 
observed Roger Norwell, and I hope Master Potts will not commence any action on his own account till he has finished my business. Assuredly not, sir, since you desire it, replied the attorney, obsequiously. But my motives must not be mistaken. I have a clear case of assault and battery against Master Nicholas Ashton, or I may proceed against him criminally for an attempt on my life. Have you given him no provocation, sir? demanded Sir Ralph sternly. No provocation can justify the treatment I have experienced, Sir Ralph replied Potts. However, to show I am a man of peace and harbour no resentment, however just grounds I may have such a feeling, I am willing to make the matter with Master Nicholas, provided he offers you a handsome consideration, eh? said the squire. Provided he offers me a handsome apology, such as a gentleman may accept, rejoined Potts consequently, and which he will not refuse, I am sure, said Sir Ralph, glancing at his cousin. I should certainly be sorry to have drowned you, said the squire, very sorry in nothing, no, I am content, cried Potts, holding out his hand, which Nicholas grasped with an energy that brought tears into the little man's eyes. I am glad that matter is amicably adjusted, observed Roger Norwell, for I suspect all parties have been to blame, and I must now request you, Master Potts, to go your search and inquiries after which until such time as you have settled this question on the boundary line for me. One matter at a time, my good sir, but Master Norwell, cried Potts, my much esteemed and singular good client, I will have no name to Norwell, peremptorily. Come, oh, muttered Potts, I shall lose the best chance of distinction ever thrown in my way. I care not, said Norwell. Just as you came up, Master Norwell, observed Nicholas, I was examining the plan of the dispute estates in Pendle Forest. It differs from yours, and correct certainly substantiates Mistress Nutter's claim. I have mine with me, replied Norwell, producing the plan and opening it. We can compare the two, if you please. The line runs thus, from the foot of Pendle Hill, beginning with Barley Boo, the boundary as marked by a storm wall. As far as certain fields in the occasion of John Odden, it is not so. It is, replied Nicholas, comparing the statement with the other line. It then runs on in a northerly direction, pursued Norwell, towards first floor, and here the landmarks are certain stones placed in the moor, one hundred yards apart, and giving me twenty acres of this land, and Mistress Nutter ten. On the contrary, replied Nicholas, this land gives Mistress Nutter twenty acres, and you ten. Then the plan is wrong, cried Norwell sharply. It has been carefully prepared, said Mistress Nutter, who has approached the table. No matter, it is wrong, I say, cried Norwell angrily. You see where the landmarks place, Master Norwell, said Nicholas, pointing to the measurements, and merely go by them. The landmarks are improperly placed in that plan, cried Norwell. I will examine them myself tomorrow, said Potts, taking out a large memorandum book. There cannot be an error of ten acres, ten perches, or ten feet possibly, but acres, huh. Laugh as you please, but go on, said Mistress Nutter. Well then, pursued Nicholas, the line approaches the bank of a rivulet called Moss Rook, a rare place for woodcocks and snipes at Moss Rook. I may remark the land on the left consisting of five acres of wasteland marked by a sheepfold and two posts, set up in a line with it belonging to Mistress Nutter. To Mistress Nutter, exclaimed Norwell indignantly, to me you you mean. It is here set down to Mistress Nutter, said Nicholas. Then it is set down wrongfully, cried Norwell. That plan is altogether incorrect. On which side of the field does a rivulet floor? inquired Potts. On the right, replied Nicholas. On the left, cried Norwell. There must be some extraordinary mistake, said Potts. I shall make a note of that and examine it tomorrow. Wasteland, sheepfold, rivulet, cold moss rock flowing on the left. On the right, cried Mistress Nutter. That remains to be seen, rejoined Potts. I have made the entry as on the left. Go on, Master Nicholas, said Norwell. I should like to see how many other errors that plan contained. Passing the rivulet, pursued Squire, we come to a footpath leading to the limestone quarry, about which there can be no mistake. Then by Cat Gallows Wood and Swallow Hole, and then by another path to Warston Moor, skirting a hut in the occupation of James Device. Aha, Master Jem, are you here? I thought you dwelt with your grandmother at Malkin Tower. Excuse me, Master Norwell, but one must relieve the dullness of this land by an exclamation or so, and here being wasteland again, the landmarks of certain stones set at intervals towards the cliff, and giving Mr. Nutter to birds of the old moor, and Master Roger Norwell one bird. False again, cried Norwell furiously. Two birds are mine, and one bird, Mistress Nutter's. Somebody must be very wrong, cried Nicholas. Very wrong indeed, I Potts, and I suspect that somebody is Master Norwell, said Mistress Nutter. Mistress Nutter, cried Master Norwell. Both are wrong, and both right, according to your own showing, said Nicholas, laughing. Tomorrow we'll decide the question, said Potts. Better wait till then, in towards Sir Ralph. Take both hands with you, and you will then ascertain which is correct. Agreed, cried Norwell. Here is mine, and here is mine, said Mistress Nutter. I will abide by the investigation, and Master Potts and I will verify the statement, said Nicholas. We will, sir, replied the attorney, putting his memorandum book in his pocket. We will. The plans were then delivered to the custody of Sir Ralph, who promised to hand them over to Potts and Nicholas on the morrow. The party then separated Mistress Nutter, shaping her course towards the window where Alison and the two other young people were seated, while Potts, looking the squire's sleeve, said with a very mysterious look that he desired a word with him in private. Wondering what could be the nature of the communication the attorney desired to make, Nicholas withdrew with him into a corner, and Norwell, who saw them retire and could not help, watching them with some curiosity, remarked that the squire's hilarious countenance fell as he listened to the attorney while
while on the contrary the features of the latter gleamed with malicious satisfaction meanwhile mistress nutter approached alison and beckoning her towards her they quitted the room together as the young girl went forth cast a wistful look at dorothy and her brother do you think with me that a lovely girl is well born said dorothy as alison feared it were he as to doubt it answered richard shall i tell you another secret she continued regarding him fixedly if indeed it be a secret for you must be sadly wanting in this sermon if you have not found it out here this she loves you dorothy exclaimed richard i am sure of it she rejoined but i would not tell you this if i were not quite equally sure that you love her in return on my faith dorothy you give yourself credit for wonderful penetration cried richard not a whit more than i am entitled to she answered nay it will not do to attempt concealment with me if i had not been certain of the matter before your manner now would convince me i am very glad of it she will make a charming sister and i shall be very fond of her how you do run on my cat cried her brother trying to look asleep but totally failing in assuming her expression stranger things have come to pass said dorothy and one reads in story books of young nobles marrying village maidens in sight of parental opposition i dare say you will get nobody's consent to the marriage of mine richard i dare say not he replied rather blankly that is if she should not turn out to be somebody's daughter should dorothy somebody i mean quite as great as the heir of middleton which i make no doubt she will i hope she may replied richard why you don't mean to say you wouldn't marry her if she didn't cried dorothy i'm ashamed of you it would remove all opposition at all events said her over so it would said dorothy and now i'll tell you another notion of mine should somehow or other it has come into my head alison is the daughter of whom do you think whom he cried guess she rejoined i can't he exclaimed impatiently well then i'll tell you without more ado she answered man it's only my notion and i've no precise grounds for it but in my opinion she's the daughter of the lady who has just left the room of mistress nutter ejaculated richard starting what makes you think so the extraordinary and otherwise unaccountable interest she takes in her replied dorothy and if you recollect mistress nutter had an infant daughter who was lost in a strange manner i thought the child died replied richard but it may be as you say i hope it is so time will show said dorothy but i have made up my mind about the matter at this moment nicholas ashton came up to them looking grave and uneasy what has happened asked richard anxiously i have just received some very unpleasant intelligence replied nicholas i told you of a menace uttered by that confounded pot on quitting me after his looking he has now spoken out plainly and declares he overheard part of a conversation between mistress nutter and elizabeth device which took place in the ruins of the convent church this morning and he is satisfied that well cried richard breathlessly that mistress nutter is a witch and in league with witches continued nicholas ha exclaimed richard turning deathly pale i suspect rascal has invented the charge said nicholas but he is quite unscrupulous in not to make it and if made it will be fatal to our relative's reputation if not to her life it is false i am sure of it cried richard torn by conflicting emotions would i could think so cried dorothy suddenly recollecting mistress nutter's strange demeanour in the little chapel and the unaccountable influence she seemed to exercise over the old throne but something has occurred today that leads me to a contrary conviction what is it speak cried richard not now not now replied dorothy whatever suspicions you may entertain keep silence or you will destroy mistress nutter said nicholas fear me not rejoined dorothy or alison she mumbled that this unhappy question should arise at such a moment do you indeed believe the charge dorothy asked richard in a low voice i do she answered in the same tone if alison be your daughter she can never be your wife how cried richard never never replied dorothy repeatedly emphatically the daughter of a witch be that witch named elizabeth device or alice nutter is no mate for you you prejudge mistress nutter dorothy cried alas richard i have too good reason for what i say she answered sadly richard uttered an exclamation of despair and on the instant of the lively sounds of tabor and pipe mixed with the jingling of bells arose from the courtyard and presently afterwards an attendant entered to announce that the mayday revellers were without and direction were given by sir ralph that they should be shown into the great banqueting hall below the gallery which had been prepared for their reception